Good morning. Someone's been driving my car. Oh. Good morning, good morning. How are you? Well, it's a lovely day in paradise. And I'm off to work. What day is it today? Thursday. Yeah. Oh, we don't like Thursdays too much. Oh, uh oh, you're coming. I might go, no, I'm going to go right again today because as you can see, it's been raining, which means there's the, the puddle of doom is probably two feet high. So, still it's nice for the first time, it's sunny. So, you know what, sun raises the spectre of being able to commit aviation. So, someone has been driving my car. Who's been driving my car? Who's been earning my UDAs? So, how are you anyway, all right? <laughs> Hope you're well. Sorry, I forgot to ask, obviously. I've had uh, quite a good week. We, uh, one day we went out to Kentucky Fried Chicken as a surgery, which is nice. That's our little treat, you know, when we've been working hard. And then uh, another day my friend who's went to Japan nine months ago came over and we went out a couple of times, once for a drink in the afternoon and once for uh, lunch. Apparently they don't really do a British fry up in Japan, so I had to take him to a trucker's cafe, you know, to get him uh, full English at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, complete with black pudding, baked beans, tomatoes, two eggs, two bangers, two rashes of bacon, and two hash browns at his existence. They've got the lot. So, yeah, I'm having a good week. So Thursday, I don't really, I don't like Thursday. We used to have Thursday afternoons off, didn't I? And then I said, I've got to, you know, when I came back from Africa, I said, I'm gonna to have to put in a bit of work between now and Easter, and that's what I'm doing really. So I'm working all day today. My, uh, lovely receptionist who used to have Thursday afternoon offers now because um, she used to go clean her nan's house and so her nan's house is no longer there because her nan's moved in with her uncle or something I don't know I'm, you know me I'll take a, a passing interest in these things by which I mean whenever they talk talking about it I pass out with boredom So it's uh, interesting times. My love of macroeconomics is paying dividends every day. You know, forget Coronation Street, forget uh, Crossroads. <coughs> Just tune into what's going on <laughs> in the world of, of uh, high and not so high finance. We've got banks going bust, getting bailed out. This is, you know, people do occasionally ask me, you know, what the hell's going on and what's uh, going to happen, you know, and what's, what does it all mean, what does it all mean? And, my standard reply, which is why I believe, is that you know when you when you're in sort of fin de regime, when your monetary the, the monetary world order is breaking down, um, it's like Alice in Wonderland. Things weird things are going to happen. Expect more weird things. That's all I would say. <coughs> you know, expect schemes, these uh, uh, bond schemes that were set up to bail out the banks all of a sudden now are worth this and depositors who were told that the first £250,000 of their deposits were guaranteed are now, are now being told that the whole, the whole uh, deposit is going to be guaranteed whether it's 5 or 10 million or 20 million or whatever uh, by, by public authorities, by the federal funds and then uh, Credit Suisse, very old bank, now just gone bust. Been bought by UBS. 
put it in a good deal for UBS. And I think that's what it boils down to. I mean, either, you know, if somebody says to you, you know, you're you're a strong company. I mind you, a few years ago, UBS wasn't a strong company. But they say, UBS, you're a strong company. Um, we've got this bank that's a bit of a basket case. Do you think you could buy it? And UBS would say, well, look, you know, due to the possibility that there's a black hole on its balance sheet somewhere, no. <laughs> Unless you sell it to us for sixpence or um, you guarantee to underwrite any problems, you know, that we experience with it, any, any failure to make a profit on the deal. And uh, even then, I don't think that they would necessarily uh, trust the government to keep that promise, you know. So uh, it all has to be money up front. You know, no, no checks. <laughs> so anyway, UBS got got a massive deal. You know, they they bought a bank that's worth billions for for a couple of billion. So, um, but this is all going on outside the uh, remit of most the, most people's orbit. You know, of their news and what they what they're aware of. So, but it's great to know what's going on. You know, I mean, it's like a real uh, insight into the machinery of the world, the actual engine room. Uh, you get to see what's going on in the engine room of the Titanic, and and most importantly, the engine room of the Titanic after it struck the iceberg. You know, and and the command structures and how they're going to cope with it with it sinking. So. The, um, it's, you know, I'm not going to go into technicalities over it. I could do, and they're fascinating, and, uh, but really, you know, honestly, if you don't follow it, you wouldn't understand it. I mean, I mean that in a nice way. You know, you, you don't, you don't want to know about what's going on in the bond market, um, you know, and the complexities of how bonds are priced and why it's all gone wrong. But, um, what most people want to know is that what's it going to mean for them, you know, in their day-to-day -day existence. Basically, what does it mean for their, their savings? What does it mean for their borrowings? So, we've just had inflation go up again from 10.4 to 10.1. Uh, sorry, from 10.1 from, from to 10.1. Point, gone up to 10.4 from 10.1. So, it's going in the wrong direction. And they, they were making such a big deal about it. Not, you know, it was still going up, but it was going up more slowly. Uh, in the same way as they they call a below inflation pay deal a pay rise, even though it's not, it's a pay cut. So this is the Alice in Wonderland world that we all live in. You know, where where a group of people set the price of money and and risk is completely uh, uh, skewed. You know, nobody nobody knows what's the price of anything anymore because. The, the actual price of money is set artificially, so uh, nothing's set by the market. Go no, on, you can do it. You can do it. No, he's doing it. he doesn't want to do it. This is the only bit of straight road that you can overtake on. And some bloke's come steaming up behind me, and if it had been me, I'd have gone with straight past him. But no, he's not going to do it. So, yeah, so I mean, you know. Uh, the, the situation with inflation and interest rates is that um, the when interest rates are lower than inflation, it rewards people to spend rather than save, and so pe because people spend, the price of everything goes up, and so that makes inflation worse. Whereas when interest rates are higher than inflation, it rewards people for saving rather than spending, and so they cut down on their spending and start putting money in savings and. And uh, so uh, demand uh, side drops, and so um, inflation goes down. Prices go down because people they can't sell so much stuff. So at the moment we have, and we've had for a long time, uh, interest rates well below the inflation rate. You know, I mean, there's a negative five percent inflation. It, 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 inflation's like ten percent, and interest rates are about five. So. Um, oh come on. So the, there's a lot of pressure on the Bank of England to put interest rates up. 
to control inflation. But the trouble is that the government has uh, written so many IOUs, bonds, that um, uh, they're getting crucified by, by, by the interest rate. Because nobody's going to buy their bonds that paid 1% on the open market if um, they can buy a bond that pays 5%. Uh, you know, that's been newly issued. So uh, the uh, government bonds, which were supposed to be the most liquid and the most, uh, well, well, they probably still are liquid in that you can sell them, but you just can't sell them for what you expected to sell them for. And sometimes if you hold them to maturity, you will get what you knew you were going to get and you've been promised to get and you will get it. But um, it's the, can you hold on to it to maturity? This is the question. So if somebody, if there's a bank run, and everybody wants their money out then and you're a bank and you're selling you're holding bonds as collateral uh, for all the money you've lent out or all, all the money you've um, you know you've you've got in your all the deposits you've got and you hold bonds as collateral you turn that money into bonds and then people want their money back and then you've got long duration bonds that uh, you can only sell for 80 pence on the on the pound so well, that's about as technical as you need to get with it. But um, it's quite funny because you've got this tension. There never used to be a tension between uh, central banks and governments. Central banks were obviously influenced by governments and then they decided to call themselves independent central banks. But they were, it's like independent my foot, you know, in the same way as the independent review on doctors and dentists remuneration was independent, i.e. wasn't. And um, so what happened was, uh, for a long time, governments weren't needed money, wanted money, well, need, wanted it more than needed it, really, but they wanted it. And so what they did was they wrote IOUs, and they, they were cashed by the Bank of England, who just uh, sent them money in return. And uh, and we're all like, you know, well, this is a nice, cosy arrangement. You know, you, if you want some money, you just write an IOU and you don't have to sell it. You know, you don't have to sort of, you don't have to get a loan from someone who might not want to give you a loan because you're a bad credit risk. You just send it to the Bank of England and the Bank of England just gives you the money. So it's the equivalent of having like a bank manager that, you know, every time you ring him up and say, I need to borrow another million pounds. He says, yeah, fine, I'll, uh, I'll make sure you get it tomorrow morning, uh, without limit. And then if um, you get to the point where you have to start paying some of these loans back, you just say to him, I need a, I need a million pounds to pay back my million pounds. And he's like, yeah, fine, I'll make sure you have it tomorrow morning. And so, <clears throat> with no thought at all to the amount of debt that they're racking up, you know, the government just writing these bonds, writing these bonds. So. Yeah, go on. You can all go past me. Be my guest. <coughs> Excuse me, bit of a cough. So, now, the government's like, well, we're gonna have to pay 5%. All our, our bonds are, to, to borrow money in the market, in other words, to write an IOU and get some money back, we're gonna have to start paying 5% because that's what the uh, Bank of England's put the base rate up. And why would you lend money to the government for 3% when you can lend money to the Bank of England for 5%, you know? So the government now is fighting against the Bank of England. They're in competition for the same people, the people who lend money. And uh, the Bank of England now, instead of being a sort of the lapdog of the government <clears throat> and everyone accusing them of being too tame, and doing whatever the government says, they've now started fighting the government. They're working against the government now. They're not uh, uh, <clears throat> cashing these IOUs. In fact, the IOUs that they're uh, are coming up, they're refusing to roll them over. They're saying that uh, you know we're not we're not going to give you uh, uh, more money to uh, not not at the same rate anyway. If you want to roll roll these things over, then you're going to have to do it at the current rate, which is 5%. So the cost of government's borrowing is, is shooting up. And it's it, it's pretty much at the point where they can't afford to pay it. You know, you get to the point where the whole 
output of the country is going to be um, taken up with debt interest payments if we carry on for another couple of months like this. So, uh, and, and amazingly, the government, you know, now because they're independent, the government really finds that it, when the Bank of England doesn't really want to do what the government wants it to do, which is to just allow them to print money and spend it like a drunken sailor, uh, they are now uh, in, 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 caught between a rock and a hard place because they're being murdered by debt repayment and um, and trying to sell the debt on the world markets now because the Bank of England won't necessarily buy it. So, so it's coming to something when you've got, you know, the, the Bank of England is, is what they call monetary policy because it relates to the amount of money in circulation and the government policy is called fiscal policy because and that's more like budgets and taxation and stuff like that. So we've got a contradiction now between monetary policy and fiscal policy with uh, monetary policy trying to tighten and reduce the amount of money in circulation and uh, increase the cost of borrowing and uh, government uh, policy which is um, basically trying to uh, get themselves solvent again by soaking the public through taxes, taxation. So the poor old public's getting hit two ways. So what does it mean, really? What does it mean? What does it mean? Well, Rishi Sunak's promise to reduce inflation by half, to halve inflation, which I think at the time was, he said he'd have it down to, well, I don't know, but only 5% and be ambitious. Bearing in mind that interest rates are below the rate of inflation still, so there's no, there's no sign of it coming down. It's not going to come down until him, uh, interest rates go up above the rate of inflation. So, and there we're talking about interest rates of 12%, 15%, even 17%, say, a bit like the old the, the 70s when you know inflation inflation shot up. The difference between um, the 70s and now, and I, mean, I agree, most people now alive probably don't even know about the 70s. Remember the 70s uh, when I was uh, qualified in 81, so I just about missed that. I was at university, but um, <clears throat> I do remember inflation being very high. And that's fine if you're in a job like dentistry where you can set your own fees, I mean private dentistry, then to a certain extent you are, uh, you've got that buffer, haven't you? You've got that, you're insured against inflation because if inflation is 20%, you can just put your fees up 20%. Nobody bats an eyelid because everything is going up 20%. But the main thing is you can still pay your mortgage. Whereas someone who's on the NHS, um, who's working for NHS fees, can't put their fees up 20%. And the NHS won't put the fees up 20%, and so they have to then try and do 20% more work to um, pay the mortgage. And so then <clears throat> they get a massive reduction in their standard of living. You know, fewer holidays, fewer nice meals, etc. More time at work, fewer, much less time with their family, etc. So the difference here is that in the 70s, it was mostly um, uh, companies that were in debt government didn't really have an awful lot of debt um, but the economy the, the companies had borrowed a lot of money and so that's what caused the crisis whereas now it's more the um, corporate sector and the private you know like the personal income sector haven't really uh, borrowed a lot but the government has so so um, your um, looking at a, a comparison more like the 40s the immediate post-war period where um, uh, the, you know the government had borrowed a lot of money and uh, financed it through uh, war bonds which were supposed to pay out and never did but um, you know because we had hard money there you know it was the government couldn't print a load of money they didn't I mean, they, they would have liked to say, uh, we'll print our way to prosperity, but they couldn't because they had to redeem every pound for gold. And, uh, or at least for dollars, uh, which were then uh, redeemable for gold. So, uh, you know, we had, we had sound money and people would save because they knew that their money wouldn't be uh, debased. Whereas now, uh, since 71, we've got a total 
you know, we're just exchanging pieces of paper, which the government can print as many as they like. So if you want to look for a comparison, don't look to the 70s, look to the 40s. Except that the 50s was an era of prosperity, whereas um, I don't think the 2020s or the 2030s are going to be an era of prosperity. I think it's going to be an era of high inflation and uh, drastically falling living standards for the majority of people, if only because uh, their savings are going to be uh, decimated, literally decimated, by, uh, as in, losing one-tenth, at least, every year uh, because of inflation. Here we go, another driver under instruction. Stopping, you know, causing traffic jams, stopping people getting to work. Oh, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about lorries. I know it would be very difficult to say um, no lorries on the road, you know, except during working hours, eight at nine till five. But um, they do cause a disproportionate problem in small roads. Well, the much larger lorries coming up small roads they, uh, now around here is, is a big problem. You know, my head was knocked over by a lorry the other day. So, so yeah, so higher inflation. So be prepared, because we've got 1st of April coming up, which is traditionally the uh, fee setting time for dentists. And, uh, you know, just have a look. Don't just have a look at inflation headline rates. Because, I mean, you could, like, you could put your uh, prices up 10.4%, couldn't you? You'd be per perfectly justified to. In fact, uh, you know, I, again, we've got to be careful with the language, because that's not even putting your prices up. I mean, that's, you can increase your prices by 10.4%, but that's not an increase in prices, if you see what I mean. To actually uh, charge more for what you do, you need to put them up by, say, 12% or 14%. It depends on what you think your market can stand. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky in that we've got a very well-run, uh, very efficient dental practice, and we have the system of getting the patients to pay two days in advance, which means we get virtually zero no-shows. I would say zero no-shows. And, uh, well, not unpaid no-shows anyway, you know, some paid no-shows. And um, we are, we run on time, and we are, you know, we're good at what we do. And so, um, a lot of word of mouth generated, and so we're, we're booked up. So I think probably I could stand uh, an increase. Plus, I'm mean, not even the most expensive dentist in the area anyway. I'm probably the cheapest. I mean, I'd challenge anyone to, who does a private molar root filling for 599 quid. I mean, that's the sort of level we're at. So the moral of the story is if you want to get your teeth done, go and visit a dentist who qualified in 1982. Because he'll still um, remember when you could get a full course of treatment for three quid and he'll be pricing accordingly. <laughs> anyway, we've had quite a nice new lab put in. Perhaps tomorrow I might talk to you about the lab. Uh, it's only like a very basic, uh, you know, when I say a lab, it's a sink. It's a sink. But those houses will be up soon. Yeah, I'll talk to you about um, what we're doing with the laboratory work because it's a problem that is possibly affecting quite a few people. Look at that, it's all that timber, look at that. Causing a problem. We're going to uh, do a lot of our own lab work. Which um, I'm, and I'm quite pleased about that. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be great. Quality, that's what it's all about.
quality is a very rare thing these days. You have to happen upon it by chance sometimes in a tiny surgery right at the arse end of Ramsgate. Right, lovely to talk to you. I've got some stuff to take in, so see you soon. Bye.